here because we care not just about Star Wars, but about accessibility. <laughs> we believe in this. We do this because for some of it's our job, but for some of us, it's our passion. It's everything to us. It consumes us. It becomes something kind of bigger. And I think that's, that's a really important piece of what we do, is having this belief in what we're doing and having a passion for it. Many people have passion for, for Star Wars as well. I remember the very first time that I saw uh, Episode Four: A New Hope, uh, seeing that in the theater was an unbelievable experience. I was like seven years old, and I still kind of remember that feeling of, of sitting there uh, on pins and needles, like waiting for this to happen. And I loved it because you can never see something again for the first time. When you see that movie for the first time and you go through this storyline, whether it's episode episode four or five, The Empire Strikes Back, and man, this, these, this new set of three has a lot to, to do to, to replace Empire Strikes Back as my favorite. Um, I, I remember this storyline, and I remember seeing uh, Return of the Jedi. I saw that my family was on a camping trip, and we were in Alaska. And we went to the theater in Fairbanks, Alaska to watch Return of the Jedi because it had just come out. And we were all into it. We all wanted to go and see it. This is a great, uh, amazing storyline. And then <laughs> things changed. And we had episode one, two, and three. And I love this, this piece. This is like my first uh, vision of of accessibility and, and Star Wars was like, you know, in, in accessibility, kind of like in Star Wars, there's things that we just want to pretend don't exist, right? There are, I, I want episode one and two to be gone. And we do the same, we do the same thing in accessibility in organizations all the time. There are pieces of accessibility that are needed to make things complete, and yet they kind of get swept away. Or ignored, or not even, uh, not even, not even dealt with appropriately. And I loved uh, Denise's point this morning about uh, our overemphasis on screen reader usage, and that there's actually, uh, you know, ten times as many people that have low vision needs that aren't well taken into account uh, through the work that the, that has been done uh, in in years gone by. And we need to take an approach that is much bigger than just compliance via checklists. We need to understand that, that piece of user experience. So I'm, I'm excited that there are new, uh, that there are new films coming out. Um, I don't know what to expect, but from just looking at the trailer, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. There's a lot of other similarities between, um, between accessibility and Star Wars. And one of the first things that I did when I, when I started researching this was I went to, you know, online forums because there's there's online forums for accessibility there are many more online forums for Star Wars and this is this is you know this is George Lucas's his vision his uh, his idea that Anakin is the chosen one and even when he becomes Darth Vader he is still the chosen one and and I love this because it's really it's really clear this is it right this is his vision of what this story is about and who the players are. And, and of course, because it's a forum, uh, <coughs> somebody comes along and says, well, I still think that Luke is the chosen one. So there's all this debate that goes back and forth. And, and this is, and this was like, I think I remember reading this about 10 years ago, like the posts were from 10 years ago. And then of course, you know, I think, I think it's like this. And then somebody else comes in and says, well, you are wrong. Um, if this isn't accessibility, I don't know what is, right? <laughs> this, this happens all the time. I think this, well, you are wrong, right? Some things George Lucas, Lucas leaves open to interpretation. Others he is very clear on. The chosen one's identity is cut and dry. It is Anakin Skywalker, period. Discussion closed. The exact wrong words that you ever want to see in a forum, because as soon as you say discussion closed, that brings everybody, right? <laughs> the discussion is anything but closed. As soon as somebody invokes this, 
the discussion, that's when it starts. That's basically the starting point. Uh, and, and so this person's response, I still think Luke is the chosen one. His response to this was, everything is open to interpretation. Once again, George Lucas doesn't tell me how to interpret a movie, no matter if he wrote it or not. I will never let someone else think for me. I'll make up my mind on all matters. Thank you, accessibility. But everything is open to interpretation. I'll make up my mind on all matters. You can't tell me how to think. It goes and it goes and it goes. This, this um, conversation is like a forum battle. If you, if you, you can actually look up these quotes and go and see the original, um, and you'll see all of these things. And ultimately, there is always going to be someone, even if you say that you, you have truth, you know that this is, is the case for some particular scenario, there will always be someone that knows more than you. And I put knows in quotes because in his mind, that person, they knew more. They said, you know, this is, this is my way of approaching it, and you can't tell me to approach it any other way. Four years later, the guy that said it was Luke, he went back. He's like, yeah, my bad. Uh, yeah, you're right. It was Anakin. I'm sorry that I was such a douche to you. Uh, but I get it now. Um, again, and I'm going to leave a lot of the parallels for you to kind of come up with here because I think if I call them all out, uh, we might be here a while. Um, yeah, I don't think the Empire had Wookiees in mind when they designed her, Chewie. This is one of my favorite, favorite scenes because it crystallizes this moment where, where Han and Luke and Chewie are in a stolen, uh, a stolen Empire shuttle. And this is basically their way to get into the Death Star, right? And, and I love it because it's like direct accessibility. Um, Han, you heard Han say, I don't think the Empire had Wookiees in mind when they designed it. And of course they didn't, because if you take a look at Chewie's size and Han's size, and Han is kind of more stormtrooper-y size than Chewie is, they're completely, completely different. The Empire is uniform. Stormtroopers are all the same, except for, you know, except for the Emperor's Guards, who are like a little bit different. But they, they designed and they created uniformity, right? Rank and file, they're all the same. Right? When you think back to the story of, of the rebels versus the Empire, when you look at the Empire, this is what you see. They're all clones. Right? These are Django Fett clones, for crying out loud. Right? Uniform. They are everything. And if you look at the Rebels, anytime you look at the Rebels, you see all shapes and sizes. That story, that meta message is there, whether you realize it or not. And there's a diversity in the Rebels, in the Rebel Alliance, that you don't have in the Empire. Right? We in the accessibility field, we embrace that diversity over uniformity, and we have to continue to do that. Diversity means everything. It's not just about uh, different ways of, of seeing things or different uh, abilities. It's about different ways of thinking. It's about, I, I heard uh, upstairs, Denis was also talking about uh, neuro, neurodiversity and uh, understanding uh, things like vestibular disorders, which many people have not ever heard of, but now are starting to understand that vestibular disorders are things that people have where they physically become nauseous and have headaches and feel dizzy and vertigo when they're looking at web pages. Right? Because of a lot of the parallax and scrolling effects that we're seeing, uh, they're actually inducing these feelings in people. That didn't sound right. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're creating this sense of nausea or vertigo in people that we didn't even talk about 10 years ago. Right? So some people have these, these different ways that they exist, and we need to understand that, and we need to embrace that diversity. That's a big part of, of what we do in the accessibility field, is we don't just, we don't just say that we, we uh, tolerate diversity or that we account for diversity. We need to embrace it and continue to embrace it. It's part of what makes us uh, what makes us who we are as a community.
Oh, Moody, Moody, I love you! Almost got us killed. not make you intelligent to make it out of here. No, no, Mr. Stead. Mr. Kojata Binks. Mr. Your humble servant. That won't be necessary. Oh, but it is. It is demanded by the gods it is. <laughs> you saved my attack. What's this? A local. Let's get out of here before more droids show up. One of the most hated characters <laughs> in the Star Wars universe is Jar Jar Binks. Probably seemed like a really good idea at the time. Character created to try and connect with the young ones. Um, pretty much universally <coughs> uh, despised by anybody that was older than four years old watching Star Wars. And... It may have seemed like a really good idea at the time, but clearly it wasn't. And when what you see happen, when you watch The Phantom Menace, episode one, you'll see Jar Jar Binks is like a main character almost. Right? He's there all the time. And then I think George Lucas kind of realized the error in his ways. In episode two, in Attack of the Clones, you'll actually see that he's still kind of there for continuity's sake, but he's like... He's like a, a C-lister now. He's not even in there. He's He has maybe three scenes in Attack of the Clones, and they kind of write him out of the story, and he doesn't even show up in Episode 3. We need to think about that in terms of accessibility as well. The things that you think are a really good idea at any particular time may prove to be really horrendous ideas. I've, I will put my hand up and say I have had some horrendous ideas over the last 15 years about how to approach certain accessibility things. <coughs> Had that idea, didn't work, it, we needed to move on from those things. And there's a lot of uh, concepts in accessibility that are very, very similar. Things like access keys seemed like a really good idea at the time. Things like using positive tab index <coughs> values uh, in HTML seemed like a really good idea at the time, but in practicality, when they work their way through uh, these things don't necessarily work out the way that we want them to. So we need to, to kind of accept that, move on from it, and, and kind of keep going. Um, and so that's, I love, I love Jar Jar Binks because I hate him, if that makes any sense, you know what I mean? But he, he doesn't fit for me uh, in that universe, and so I'm, I'm kind of glad that he's out of there. And we've taken these old, outdated practices for accessibility and done the same. We found better replacements and we've moved on. <laughs> One of my favorite scenes ever in The Empire Strikes Back uh, is when, when Luke, uh, after he's, he's kind of being, uh, he's, he's got his medical attention after being out in the snow. And, and attacked, um, attacked by a wampa, and he comes back in, and you can—I don't know if you can see the—you can see the tension. But Han is looking. He's like, he's pissed. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> and then Luke, Luke is like, I'm the man, right? That's what he's. That's 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 it. Right there. And Han's kind of like, what is this reaction from this kid? Right? So let's fast forward uh, to, uh, to The Return of the Jedi, one of my second favorite scenes. The Force is strong in my family. My father has it. I have it. 
my sister has it. Yes, it's you. Lots of things that, that we see in building on that, that Jar Jar Binks idea that, that things look like they're a huge win, right? And we get proud of those things, and, and they maybe don't turn out to be quite as big a win uh, and maybe fit more in the fail category uh, than we originally uh, thought they were, right? We're always, learn, we're always learning new things that make us cringe at the things that we used to do. I look back at code that I wrote, uh, you know, five years ago, ten years ago. I, by today's standards, I, I would just like, well, that's weak. What what is that? Right? That's we we have to be okay with this. Right? You should be cringing at things that you used to do. If you're happy right now with what you were doing five years ago, that means you haven't moved on. That you haven't learned new things. The accessibility field, we have, to, we have to be able to do this. We need to be able to cringe at the things that we were doing before and question, what were we thinking? Because if we can do that, that means we've moved on and we're in a better place now. <laughs> attacked by the Wampa. Now this this movie, do you remember what year uh, Empire Strikes Back came out? 1980. Does anybody remember two decades before that? Not really. <laughs> Twelve years before that, in 1968, another color movie came out and it was called Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Do you remember him? That's Bumble, and that's the Wampa. Now, George Lucas created the Wampa, but the other dude, because I can't remember his name right now, created Bumble. This is basically an abom abominable snowman, and... I don't think you can deny that there's some family resemblance there. <laughs> One of the things that we need to do, and for George Lucas, for all his genius, if you've read anything, um, uh, you know, his, uh, George Lucas's movie, the, the very first one, A New Hope, was actually very much influenced by uh, a, a Japanese war movie from, I don't remember when it was, when it was made, but the, the entire story follows... Uh, what Joseph Campbell calls the hero's journey, and it's a very, very similar, uh, very, very similar storyline, and everything kind of fits together. We we look at George Lucas and say he was a genius for creating this stuff. He was really just kind of putting his own twist on it. He took it instead of it being, uh, you know, a, 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 a Japanese war story, he turned it and took it into space. Right? You may have heard this line before, that good artists copy and great artists steal. Uh, and I'm not advocating that we should go and steal things. Uh, but I do want everybody to go and steal ideas. We need to go and look for inspiration based on things that have been successful elsewhere. I know one of the things that we try to do uh, in, in our accessibility work, when we're coming up with a new, or we're seeing a new problem, or something new that we're trying to solve, we, as much as possible, look back to other things that have been successful. We look to the physical world, for example, to find ways of solving particular problems so that we can take that success and then bring it into the digital world. Right? We should be doing that kind of thing. Looking to, uh, looking to how things have worked uh, on mobile devices and assistive technology on a mobile. How can you take something like that and then build it into your work? And even something simple. Does anybody use the, the app called Path on their, on their phone? 
So Path is an, is an app, and I loved it because it, it's a great little social networking type app, and they have one of the coolest menus ever. Their menu is like a little a little button that you tap. It's in the bottom in the bottom corner. It was in the bottom left corner, which was great for somebody holding it with their right hand. You could reach across with your thumb. You would tap on the button, and this menu would kind of fly out. And then you would tap it again, and the menu would collapse back down. Really great for somebody that was right-handed. Right? And so then that becomes a challenge for somebody that's left-handed because you can't reach that easily with your thumb because it's in the bottom left corner. <clears throat> so I remember saying probably three years ago, maybe not three years ago, maybe two years ago, whatever it was, that menu for somebody that's left-handed should actually be on the other side right? so that it's in the optimal spot. And the newest version of Path, they've actually brought the menu to the middle. So instead of being in one of the corners, it's directly in the middle, so a left-handed person or a right-handed person could actually tap it very easily and the menu shows up. Why aren't we doing things like that with our mobile websites? Why aren't we making it so that the, you know, the hamburger menu that we have in the mobile versions of our sites, why is that in the top corner? That doesn't make any sense. Right? If, you, if you use the, the Facebook app or even the Facebook mobile version, the, the menu used to be up at the top and now it's down at the bottom. It's in a better place. We should be looking in as many ways as possible, looking for inspiration on what works elsewhere to solve certain accessibility problems and bringing them into the work that we're doing on the web. There's no reason, for example, that we couldn't allow somebody to position that hamburger menu in any corner that they wanted to. Right? Drag that menu and drop it, put it in a corner, it persists there until you decide to change it or reset the preference. There's zero, zero reason for not doing that. Does that make sense? That was an, almost a double negative. There's zero reason to not do that. Right. There's, zero, there's no reason to not do that. We should be looking for inspiration in as many places as we can, whether it's the physical world or other things that are happening. Uh, you know, we're web, maybe we're web developers, but we should be looking at apps to see how they're solving problems. Bring those things into, into our work. Oh, this, yeah, this is going to, which one is it? Oh, yeah. So this is a this is the two and a half minute clip. So I hope you're ready. <laughs> That's it. I'm turning back. I know your family's waiting. I know it's an important day. Arthur, Art 
party. Diane Carroll. The Jefferson Starship. Harvey Corman. And an animated Star Wars story on the Star Wars Holiday Special. second Star Wars movie ever made. You can actually watch the entire thing on YouTube. It is real. George Lucas <laughs> George Lucas denies that it exists. He says that he wishes he had never ever made this thing. It was like a special on on NBC or CBS or something like that. It is it is real. I actually have a DVD copy that was like bootlegged kind of recording uh, of VHS and, and mastered to DVD and cleaned up a little bit. Um, in, incredible Luke looks like a 12-year-old girl. Um, Han is just, well, he's Han. Um, that was the introduction of Boba Fett. That was the first time that Boba Fett appeared, was in this animated, in the animated short that went with it. And this was a thing. You can go and watch this. I think it's in 10 different parts. It's all uh, all online on YouTube, unless it's been taken down now. Um, fans, Star Wars fans all around the world, want this to actually be re-released and put out in some digital forum so that everybody can get it, and they won't do it. They just won't do it. They they basically, I mean, the Jefferson Starship, Diane Carroll, I mean, this, this has all the stars in it. Um, this, this was kind of a big deal. I remember seeing it on TV. Now, did you catch the stuff about Chewbacca's family? <laughs> his wife, Mala, his, his father, Itchy, and his son, Lumpy. You can watch this, and if we continued on from there, in the very first part, it's ten, almost ten minutes of Wookiees. <laughs> you can imagine that conversation. <laughs> in accessibility all the time, and I'm not going to say exactly how, but if one Wookiee is good, certainly hundreds of Wookiees must be awesome, <laughs> right? Completely not. We've seen, we've seen this happen where we've told teams, headings are good for accessibility, and then the next time we checked up on them, there were 352 headings on a page that had been styled to look like paragraphs. <laughs> because headings are good for accessibility, so therefore 352 headings must be really, really good for accessibility. Right? <laughs> These things happen all the time. We want to be cautious of this kind of thing. And I, I think we're in a very similar position right now with things like ARIA landmarks. ARIA landmarks, if we have too many of them in our template, they become way too noisy. They become way too difficult to process because we're getting all these extra signals and things that a screen reader is saying to the person trying to navigate through that site. And when we hear landmark start, whatever kind it is, landmark end, landmark start, and you're hearing that there's 10 or 15 or whatever number of landmarks in a page, it's almost too many. So when you're thinking about putting landmarks in your page, when you're thinking about doing things with headings, think of the Wookiees. Think of the Star Wars Holiday Special and know that the only reason that headings work and that landmarks work is because of contrast. Right? If everything's a heading, nothing is a heading. If everyone's a Wookiee, yeah, no, that's not going to work, but it's still... <laughs> If you ever need that reminder, go and look up that first clip of the Star Wars Holiday Special. Watch the Wookiees for 10 minutes. And remember, just like shake your head. <laughs> this is, I almost bought this. This is a, a photo of one of the um, precursors, not the final script of A New Hope, but it was like two versions back kind of thing. And I almost bought this on eBay because I was going through this period of like, I need more Star Wars memorabilia. I need, I have, 
I have all the comics at home. Like Marvel uh, had a set of released comics, like a hundred, hundred and something. I can't remember how many there are. I have those comics at home. I have all kinds of other things that I found. I have. I'm gonna just say this. Don't think I'm weird, but I have a box. Oh, you probably already do. That's okay. <laughs> Why is he in a robe? I have a box at home of, uh, you know how we used to have hockey cards, baseball cards. I have uh, a box unopened of Star Wars trading cards, of Empire's, no, Return of the Jedi uh, trading cards. And I've never even opened them. There's the gum and everything. It's all in there. And I just, I collected all of these things. And one of the things I wanted was this script. And it was about, I think, from what I remember, it was two versions back of the final and so this is what the opening of Star Wars would have looked like if this was the version of the script that had gone live. So I'm gonna we'll, we'll have that other little intro, uh, and here we go with some some music again. Space suit. <laughs> He's in space. Can't take much more. The <laughs> you saw the title, right? The the Adventures of Luke Starkiller. Uh, as taken from the Journal of the Wills. Right? Like, what title is that? <laughs> that doesn't make... I mean, that's that's what it was. That was what was listed at the beginning of the script. But for a script, maybe it's okay. But for release as a movie, no way. Right? And it started off differently. A long time, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, an incredible adventure took place. Right? There was a lot of, a lot of things that happened between iterations. And that's... Where, where I want to focus here, in the accessibility world, just like George Lucas, we need to be able to, to iterate. This, you might recognize this, this, I love Star Wars art. I don't know if you're, if you're fans of Star Wars or if you've seen uh, some of the art uh, of Ralph McQuarrie. Uh, but this is some of his concept art. So they, they <clears throat> map things out and they would have artists come in and, and paint. Right? They would paint these scenes so that they could frame up what the movie was going to be like. It was like really uh, detailed level of storyboarding kind of thing. You might recognize that now. What is this place? The Death Star. It's not the Death Star. It's Cloud City. Right? Cloud City is Bespin. Right? This shows up in The Empire Strikes Back. Well, in the original, this was actually Alderaan. Right? This was actually Alderaan, the planet where Princess Leia is from, that they actually blow up. Right, that uh, the that the Death Star actually blow. Everybody's seen Star Wars, right? These aren't spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I probably should have asked that about a half an hour ago. But. <laughs> so, the the Cloud City. This was Alderaan. Alderaan was supposed to be like Leia's home. How much more of an impact does it make when the Death Star blows up not a city but an entire planet? Right. But we have this had this idea. They had this concept art, and so what they ended up doing is they took this and they said, let's make this, you know, and I'm, I'm putting ideas in, in their heads and how they did it, but this actually ends up showing up, even though it was a scrapped idea for Leia's home, it shows up later on as the cloud city of Bespin in The Empire Strikes Back. Right? We have to be able to iterate this. Who does this look like right here? Can you see that? It looks like Yoda, but that was the original concept for Chewbacca, right? Still huge, tall, but he kind of looked like Yoda, right? You can see earlier versions of R2, uh, 3PO here, the protocol droid, different versions of, I don't know who those really are. Uh, maybe that's Leia with, with Luke, I'm not sure. Uh, but they had these concepts. Does anybody watch uh, the Clone Wars, the, the animated series? There's actually a character in Clone Wars that looks very similar 
to this version uh, of the Wookiee. Right? These concepts, they may have died at a certain point, but maybe we weren't ready for them yet. We have to continue to iterate. Every solution that we create in accessibility, we need to treat it like it's our best understanding at the time and be willing to iterate from there and continue on. And we make things better by doing that. Now, I like the continued evolution of where we're going, and I had to throw these in because these scenes from the new movie that are coming out from J.J. Abrams, seeing these X-Wings flying right at water level and seeing the, everything spray, the detail that's in there, um, this is very exciting as the next iteration, uh, and these, this, these are going to be better than, than Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones for sure. I mean, execute Order 66, Executive Order 66, I mean, really? Come on. And if you don't know Star Wars, you know what I'm talking about, just nod and smile and I'll be okay with it. Um, this, these scenes from Star Wars, and this one here too, with this ridiculous lightsaber that I don't care if it's unrealistic. I just want to see that, right? I don't care, but this is like the next iteration. And everybody's like, oh, well, this... This would never work. That's a that's a guard that's supposed to prevent, like the lightsaber is going to go right through that. It's not protective at all. And like, who cares? Just watch the movie. This is going to be awesome, right? We need to to face these kinds of things and move on from them. How many times in accessibility have you heard that'll never work, or that's unrealistic, right? It doesn't matter. We keep doing it anyway. And we keep pushing forward. I like when people tell me that something can't be made accessible. I want you to believe that. So that when I show you that it can be, you're like, well, holy crap. How did you do that? I remember making in, in 2005, we were working.